Welcome to the Fitfiliate Podcast, where with honesty and transparency, we talk about all things fitness, coaching, and gym ownership, so that you can feel less crazy and frustrated and alone, while you also find more freedom and make more money. And welcome back to another episode of the Fitfiliate Podcast, and again, I'm joined by Tony and Chuck. How are you, gentlemen? How do you decide which days it is sequenced as Chuck and Tony and which days it's sequenced as Tony and Chuck? I'm curious because there, well, there's a pattern established. Well, actually, every time it's Chuck and Tony, and it always has been since I met you, but so today I deliberately changed it up for a bit of variety to see if you noticed. So there you go. Just I didn't want Tony to feel like he's the, the second second chair all the time. I, I mean, generally speaking, I assume that it, it makes more sense if Tony comes on the end only because I'm further in the alphabet and it just flows mm. better that way. Yeah, <laughs> it, it didn't feel right saying it, but, you know, we've thrown it out there now. Um, gentlemen, I thought an interesting topic today, searching the grams recently, there's been a lot of debate from various uh, influencers, if you will, about, you know, that the group model uh, that CrossFit follows or you know, a lot of places follow is uh, not great. It's not the best way to support humans and you're unable to provide individual solutions in that setting. So I thought today it'd be great to hear your thoughts on why the group model is so important and, and so powerful and, and works so well and how you can still provide uh, those solutions for people. Um, Before we do that, can we talk about how I think one of the biggest, biggest skills in here is your ability to turn these questions into very political and politically <laughs> correct versions of it? It's, so it's it's you know clickbait. We need to get some uh, audience. So you know I'm Perfect. I'm I'm catching on with uh, Joe Rogan. So I'm trying to you know and get I fun said politically correct. Um, yeah. Anyway, and what matters? Uh, go ahead, Chuck. Tell him. Well, like so, are we at the point where a, a- question has been like fully phrased well yeah why is why do you do we i know in affiliate land you know you're protecting affiliate owners and like to protect the affiliate model so you know why is the group model so um valuable look at this and important the the students become the teacher you see how she circled all the way back to a why for the question all right so like why do we want people to work out so they can be their best, lead the full functional lives. Right. We, we assume there is some level of benefit to it, right? Like we would yeah. certainly hope so to build fucking careers and businesses and industry around it. We want some good things to happen with fitness because we would all agree that people's lives are better when they have fitness rather than when they have sickness in abundance. Cool? Mm-hmm. Yep. Cool. Do we know objectively so not any feelings but do we know objectively statistically mathematically that like people are bad at fitness on their own when left to their own devices are most people fit or sick uh they're mostly sick okay and that's Um, that's, there's hard data right what would we what would we want to use as like a, a base number for people that have shown that they cannot adequately manage health and fitness on their own as a as a percentage look I'll use a percent of, of members that I know in my box and it would easily be 90% who have tried doing going it alone and have failed miserably and did not enjoy it even. Okay. So, yeah, by the time, like, <laughs> and so that that's probably pretty interesting, right, is that, like, most people that have found success, we have almost a 100% incident rate of, like, people who have found success, found success through coaching. Mm-hmm. We would assume that, like, most people not capable of doing it on their own. Yep. Um, Let's let's pull some data. So what do we want to – let's pick a chronic disease. What what do you guys want to use for the chronic disease that we're going to say, like, if this shows up, you're for sure not healthy? I'll take heart disease for 500, Chuck. Okay. (laughs) So let's look at heart disease rates and see if we can find a pretty solid. Well, one in four deaths is attributed to heart disease. That's pretty wild. So like, let's look at that. So we'll look at it catastrophically. And if we know that one in four, because that's when you got a lot of sickness, right? When you die. 
Mm -hmm. That's the max level of sickness. That that is the max level of sick is dead. (laughs) Yep. All right. So we'll... I'm not going to be able to find something global that scales super effectively. So we can look at off of the U.S. So... Uh, 10, seven, all right. We will go with heart disease one and four out of three. three. All right. So we're assuming 3.3 million deaths in the U S annually. 825,000 of that is the one in four as like heart disease. Cool. Yep. So looking at scaling those numbers across the whole population, because we're looking at that as like our big indicator. What's, what is U S population at present? (laughs) 300. Okay. So that actually like scales pretty effectively. So like death rate is basically 10% of the, the whole. Um, cool. So a quarter of those people would be potentially at risk. So what is a quarter of the U S population? That would be, okay. So a, if, if we know that everybody in the U S will die at some point, would we all agree on that? Yes. Everybody in America will die at some point, except probably like Elon Musk, because that yeah. motherfucker's going to be uploaded to a computer. He will be the AI. So if we know that like everybody's going to die eventually, and at present, based on how sick we are, because this is where we're going with the whole thing, one in four of those deaths is sickness. Cool. So we know that of all of the people living in the U.S., since they will all die, it is a reasonable assumption that a quarter of them, if like nothing will change, will die from heart disease. Cool. So that leaves us with... 82,750,000 people who for sure are not capable of finding or managing or handling health on their own to the level with which like they will actually die because of their inability to manage health and fitness. So does that seem like a logical train of numbers so far in the conversation? One in four people die of heart disease in America. So we're going to assume that one fourth of America is at risk of dying from heart disease. If we don't have a group model Could somebody please break down the numbers of how the fuck we take care of 83 million people getting individualized coaching? How many coaches do we need to make that happen? Well, the certain named figure in the unnamed figure in the community assumes a full time coach to have a workload between 20 and 25 coaching hours a week. Correct. Cool. Yep. So assuming that like most people probably need more than one session a week, what's the total client load to make that happen? Yeah, it's huge <laughs> let's, let's, let's be generous and say that we're working with eight clients and they get three one-on-one sessions a week because we're fucking we're professional coaches we've gone pro we're so good at what we do that we can resolve all of the world's ailments of like health and fitness through three sessions a week to maintain the an overall workload of 24 so that gives us 24 coaching hours eight clients three times a week yep cool so that works like relatively in favor of our numbers Roughly, and that means that how many coaches do we need to do full-time, individualized, personalized training just to only stop one quarter of the world from potentially dying, not even make anybody else any fitter? Well, in America, we would need 10,343,000 full-time PT Mm -hmm. coaches. Yeah, it's not. So if we want to like really get silly from there, so we, we understand that like that doesn't actually scale effectively for service providers, but what if we work in the back side of it to look at like being able to actually scale to the people that need it? Do we feel like it's reasonable that 83 million Americans have the time, energy, and financial resources to have a professional exercise coach so that they can do three one-on-ones a week? No. Not if that said exercise professional wants to actually earn enough to feed themselves for the week, no. So, like, we we end up in a place where the group models the necessity for, even on the the most basic of levels, just, like, overcoming the mathematical, logistical, like, hurdle. How do we serve enough people, and how do those people that need servicing have the ability to interact with that servicing fiscally? 
So it's great if like if we want to build career individual PT coaches, that also presupposes that we're probably targeting the top like one to twenty percent income. More often than not, those are not the people that need fitness the most. So we have a, a moral quandary that presents itself where if we really do assume that fitness really does matter because we do want to change people's lives, it just doesn't work to do it one person at a time. Yeah. And even if we're talking beyond fitness as in the actual sweaty exercise, air squats and pull-ups into education pieces on nutrition, if you had to educate every single one person individually on what to eat rather than being able to talk to a group, you sort of lose that that ability to have impact even on a small scale with somebody. Well, and so like even if you could turn, you know, fuck, if you had some kind of magic wand and you could make like an eighth of the world's population all into full-time coaches to facilitate that like that eight to one ratio would actually work out and an eighth of the planet was individual coaches. People still need a group. People have always needed a group. Yeah, I mean, for sure the one thing we don't need is less access, right? I mean, that's the right, big yeah. problem. So I've yeah. been bitching enough. Like, Tony, talk. <laughs> Tony, take the mic! <laughs> I don't want the mic. But the reality is that the approximate number of fitness professionals in the United States, is, and it's a big range, is somewhere between 200 and 400,000. Like, it's a far cry from the 10 million that you need. But much the same as the fight that existed for many years in CrossFit, which was against licensure, Right? Like the whole reason for that fight wasn't that we didn't want people to be more validated. We didn't want people to be less educated and less certified and less qualified. It was that the one thing we for sure do not need fucking less of is access to health. Right. And so the group model just is the only conceivable, scalable, presentable solution to the world's most vexing problem. There's just no way around it. There's nothing wrong with personal training and individualized attention and all those things because they're absolutely fantastic in terms of relationships and otherwise. And, and for sure, they create results. But if we're going to solve the world's problem, and let's be very clear, that's CrossFit's goal, or at least it used to be, was that they were going to eradicate obesity at a world level. There's no space there for the PT. Really. Can PT be a value add? Can it be a, a value to the, the, the provider and the professional? Yeah, a ton of value. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's still solving for the why. And so as people who are obviously obsessed with whys over whats, the reason why groups have to exist is there a what to the why. And that why is that if we're going to change the fucking planet and we do believe that we're going to change the planet, it ain't going to happen one on one. New topic. Just kidding. <laughs> Mic drop out. But it, it is interesting, though, um, the perception that you can't provide um, individualised options and programming and attention within the group model well, um, and, do that, and do that very well um, versus, you know, this, there is only one way to, to, to meet someone's needs. Because you're bad that it can't happen. <clears throat> Okay, and yeah, so like maybe maybe that's worth exploring. Um, probably like option A, when somebody's got a really loud opinion about something, it's probably worth looking at what their vested interest in that opinion being correct is. Mm -hmm. Like for us, like, dude, PT is amazing. We encourage all of our clients to offer PT because like it is an incredible route to coaches making money. It is an incredible route to letting people be served at a higher level. But to presuppose that it's the only place they get a higher level of service is a fucking fool's errand. So like if, you know, if it really wants to be defended from like some stratified fucking pillar of academia, cool. Let's assume that we have clients who very deliberately want to be strong. Cool. If we're looking at maximizing work rest ratios for strength adaptations, how long would we have somebody rest between sets? Three to five minutes. Great. So do something. And while you're resting for three to five minutes, would I have the ability to interact with another human? Yep. I would certainly fucking hope so. 
could I probably interact with more than just one other human? Mm. And so Absolutely. it's really interesting, like, at what level is individual group? You know, would somebody argue that, like, you couldn't, as a, a qualified, educated, experienced coach that knew your shit, could you handle two people at once? Or is that group? Mm. Like, at what point is it individual and at what point is it group? Because, like, how we have always viewed it, and this is through the time in CrossFit Gymnastics, the gymnastic course, the affiliate, you're never coaching a class of 12 people. You're coaching 12 individuals at once. And there is adequate and ample time to give people acknowledgement, fault fix relationships, cues, corrections, interventions, constraints. Like, you have time to get the job done if you're reasonably good at doing the job and you understand that most people have reasonably accessible fixes to make in such a large number of areas that it's disingenuous to assume that they need one hour of dedicated attention to fix any piece of their problems. What is it? Is it that they're that fucked up? They're that broken and faulty and flawed that the only way that they have a chance to succeed is to have one hour at a time of one person's dedicated attention. Mm. Man, that seems pretty miserable. And, and to be honest, in, in my experience in the last eight and a half years, the number of people I've had come through my door where I'm like, the only way to help you is, you know, classes aren't going to work for you because of, uh, the issues that they've had has been incredibly small percentage wise. And I'll regularly say to people that, yeah, we programmed the one workout today, but there's going to be 10 variations of that happening in the class at any one time because it's custom to people by talking to them and understanding their needs and saying, okay, Chuck, today you're going to be doing this. Tony, you'll do this. It's, you know, because we might be a group, but we take the time to understand our people and build I mean, the relationships. Let's just be honest with one thing. It's just exercise. It's it's adult playtime for one hour. Right? Like it's not any more complicated than that. It's not any more serious than that. Your ability to apply and implement a system and a procedure, otherwise known as a program like CrossFit, would dictate your expertise and your skill set. But at the end of the day, running a class is essentially just basically managing adult playtime. Right. Because for most people, that's really all it comes out to be. So, you know, the, the first big problem that exists for for most people as it applies to group models that they're just not good at it. Right. It's hard. It's not it's certainly much harder to, to handle 20 problems at one time than it is to handle one problem at one time. And I think for a lot of people, they should probably start there one at a time. Right. Until they understand something. But the thing you need to understand after enough time doing it. There's no right answer, right? I mean, if, if the answer is get to four, and that quite, quite literally is the answer, right? Like not literally four, but like if we're trying to get people all the way over the wellness continuum to life, right? Like how you get there, how you get to four could be two plus two. It could be one plus one plus one plus one. It could be three plus one. It could be any number of sequences uh, of arrangements of a sequence that would get you to four. And it doesn't really matter how you get there as long as you get there, right? And this is the, the foundational conversation, which we've talked about before, which is coaching versus teaching or training. And there's a lot of trainers and a lot of teachers who are very invested in making sure that what they have spent their life chasing is the right answer. But coaches, the foundation difference between a coach is that coaches don't believe there's one right answer. We believe that the answer is understanding and what we understand is what the limitation is. If I'm going to get Lisa to four, it's not about how to tell her how to get to four. It's how she's not getting there on her own. Right. And like, and in a group model, the reason why the group model works is because the group model exposes not only the provider, the coach, but also all the people in the group exposure to alternative options, because that's really all coaching is, is seeing the world for the people who do what they do, not because it's the right thing to do, but it's because it's what they've always done. Coaches see the world for alternative options. That's clearly not working. Why is that not working for you? How do I get you to four? Right. And in the group model, not only does it allow for more people to access it more readily and more availably, it just gives them more opportunities for 
for advancement, more opportunities for awareness, more opportunities for, for alternative options, more pursuits. It just creates much better situations. It, however, does require the person who stands at the front of that room to know how to do that. And so like you hear it all the time from CrossFit affiliates say like, there's too many affiliates. This market's saturated, like competition's too high. It's not that there's too many affiliates. It's just that they're too bad at getting access to more people, right? Like if you want more people, go get more people. So it's not that the, you need there to be less affiliates because we don't need that, especially if we're all in pursuit of the same why, which is eradicating obesity. We need every affiliate to win. You just need to find a way to accommodate the lack of a skill set you have, which is getting more people in the gym. The same thing happens at a coaching level in your classes. Right? Like, <clears throat> there's no right way to teach the squat. There's just an agreement. What is the right squat? How you get them there is irrelevant because each person is going to dictate that journey. And, and so that's what the coach. argument is being is that like we can't facilitate this individual journey to something like a squat unless we're just doing one person, one problem at a time. And like that's a fucking fallacy. And everybody that's been in a even remotely well-run group model knows that not to be true. Because our needs vary by what? Degree, not kind. Everybody needs mm -hmm. to figure out how to fucking squat. So if the wad, the workout of the day is a squat piece, well then like I can back squat, you can front squat and Tony can overhead squat and somebody else can goblet squat like because they're squats. Mm. And so we, we meet in the middle between the people's wants and their needs with what the facilitation of the program is to deliver like the universal shit that everybody needs. Mm. And it, it works really fucking well in a group. And I think that most people would prefer to be served in a group. Well, I mean, I don't feel problem. any kind of way about that. Like, I've been in this for fucking 15 years. Like, most people would rather be a part of a group than mm. on their own, regardless of limitations of time, energy, finances, like, level of problems or severity. Like, most people would opt in to be in a group. Because if we're looking at making people fit for the rest of their fucking lives and we do assume that there's some level of importance for the four walls other than the gym and the 23 hours of the day other than being in there, if all we build is an isolated relationship of one person resolving one other person's problems by themselves in a fucking bubble, how much are we missing to contextualize the majesty and beauty of fitness and exercise to everything else that we do believe matters even more than what happens in the gym? As guides for the hero, we don't get to build a bridge to translate the experience into anything productive or meaningful. So, like, great. You could build the world's most fucking robust, solid, healthy, functional athlete in, in an echo chamber of just the two of you. And that sucks. They're diminished in the experience. And so it's less valuable. Mm. I mean, that's the coach's job, right? I mean, a coach's job, my job as a coach is to show people alternatives, period regardless of what it is, whether it be one-on-one -on -one or 20 on one, it doesn't really matter. It is my job foundationally to show you the alternative. And this is actually tomorrow's post, but and it's funny how this always seems to happen, but, and it's then coaching versus teaching. There's absolutely nothing wrong with teachers. The world is full of fantastic teachers and they need them. Same with trainers. It's just that coaches don't believe the world to be a one right answer world, right? We believe that there is multiple routes to the same problem or the same solution, and it's our job to figure out which one it is. Because here's the thing. At the end of the day, the thing that requires a human to be able to achieve and, and to invest himself in the pursuit and, and to take action, they have to believe it's possible. Right? Like if, you've, if you've coached people one-on-one -on -one and you've taught intensity, you know one thing. All things in life are relative, but I can for sure tell you and guarantee you that one thing above all things that's relative is intensity. Right. And so one on one, walking up the stairs sucks. Running up the stairs really sucks. Right. But like if I didn't know that everybody else was running up the stairs, I would probably think that this was sufficient just walking up the stairs. And that is why the group model is so valuable, because intensity is the most important resource and variable in adaptation. Mm -hmm. It can be elicited in an individual model and for sure it will probably be the hardest workout that humans ever done but it's not the hardest workout they can do. 
And, and to understand intensity, I think is to strip it of like, just trying to die in a workout, but understand that people will only push themselves as hard as they see possible. Not only does that mean for a time in a workout, but that also is things like squatting below parallel, fixing a problem, right? Like I might yeah. be completely aware that my shoulder doesn't yeah. work. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe that's it is like the, this misconception of what intensity means because we lose sight that it is just like effort relative to somebody's potential. Mm. So like Tony's saying, like, it's easy to think about it as running or rowing or like lifting heavy shit or doing Fran, but like, how about a Turkish getup? What is a Turkish mm. getup like, you know, in isolation for somebody in their, their limiting belief of their capacity than when they see it showcased in a group and people mm. less muscular than them, older than them, more overweight than them, like a million other characteristics that they would have otherwise limited themselves with, they see themselves outperformed in a, in a metric of mobility and function and coordination. Oof, that's a very different application of intensity. How hard are you and, trying to do what you can do? And uh, let's just use that as an example. That um, And it always shocks my crew when I program them as a Turkish get up as an example. Oh, wow, that was my heart rate's up. I'm sweaty. Like it was really hard just to do, you know, three reps on each side for five sets or whatever it is. They're like, oh, yeah, you don't have to run, you know, 1.6 Ks 15 times over to feel like you've, you've had a workout. It, you can get intensity through those other ways. But, but as Greg Glassman said, you know, people, will, humans will die for points. And if you've got someone next to you going that little bit faster and you think, well, I should be that little bit better, you're going to push more than you would by yourself, even with a trainer standing over you. Well, well yeah, like the group can solve for quality, not just quantity or intensity. Like, you know, if uh, we might have had you at some point read um, Hooked, we probably had you at some point read Atomic Habits. And so if we look at, you know, the ability of humans to engage and develop better habits, we can change the reward mechanism so they still get little hits of dopamine. And like, what an exceptional place to do that in the group environment. So if we're talking about Turkish get-ups, and we aren't even concerned with the overall idea of intensity, but we look at intensity relative to your ability to maximize healthy, productive shoulder position. The reward mechanism in the group can be, hey, everybody look at Mary's shoulders. That's the ideal. That's where I want you guys to work on getting to. And what do we also know? Man, Mary is 62. Mary's got a fucking T-spine that's locked up like it's made out of wood. Mary tore her fucking shoulder in college as a diver. But look mm. at her now. Wow. What can we accomplish with a group with giving you the better piece to chase an imitation that helps you rewrite your own belief structure? Because you have no choice but to believe that there is capacity because the person right next to you is doing the thing. How yeah. much do we expedite the learning process if we would agree that humans learn through imitation? If we have multiple good examples for anybody to see at any given time of a movement, that certainly doesn't make learning any slower or worse. Hmm. I mean, fuck, we could, we could defend it in a million ways. Anyway, that's enough of me ranting. It's, it's kind of the, the thing too. If, it, if you are looking at, you know, for someone new or slightly deconditioned and they're looking around a room of people, they can see where they fit within the tribe and go, oh, I feel like I'm really bad at this, but actually I'm not so bad because I've got a little bit more weight or I'm moving a little bit better versus just seeing the elite person at the front do it and go, oh, well, I'm nowhere near that. I'm, I'm clearly... You know, Every CrossFit gym it. gets it, I think. And that's what really truly drives the tribe together is because there's there's something that binds us all together. And, and that thing is that I believe, and I'm, I'm bold enough to say that it is that we all believe that like if you can show somebody that there's an alternative option, there's an alternative possibility, then it can open their mind to the possibility that that solution can exist for them you know, or it can be followed. Right. And like that is truly what happens in across the gym on a day to day basis, because for most people, until they get into a gym, until they get into an environment like that, which is really, truly unique to across the gym. Are they completely aware of not necessarily what they're capable of, but what humans are capable of? Because when you see everybody else doing this thing, right? like the joke is like eight minute Fran is the hardest fucking thing you've ever done in your life. And then you see somebody do it in three minutes and you're like, well, fuck me, I guess. Right. Like and. 
if that didn't exist and that didn't happen, you know, as a trainer working one on one with you, I could tell you, I got a guy, his name's Chuck. He does this in three minutes. He'd be like, well, fuck that guy. Right. Cause like the reality is that humans are dismissive. Right? It's, it's our, it's in our nature to be that way because it's safe. It keeps us efficient. It keeps us from expending useless energy. And the reason why we're dismissive is that when, at the end of the day, it's a defense mechanism. We want it to be okay. Right. Like it's like the whole, well, it runs in my family. The only thing that doesn't run in your family is you, right? Like that's all it is. And as soon as somebody in the family does start running, all of a sudden the gene expression begins to disappear, right? Because like, sure, no doubt about it. You probably have genetic biomarkers that suggest that like you're going to be bigger, you're going to be unhealthier. But like, believe it or not, the human body is pretty adaptive and it will respond to whatever the stimulus is. And so sure you could have those biomarkers but guess what fitness is just a hedge right like the better you do it the more you do it the less those things matter those biomarkers matter but the less you do it the less you do fitness and in the worse you do fitness the more those biomarkers matter so it's not that those things aren't valid that people aren't valid in it it's just that until they get into an environment like a class and they realize they're like people like me do things like this and i should be able to do things like that and I can't, am I going to truly express myself and try, right? Because like, the first time I get my ass beat by a 60 year old lady in a workout, which is definitely going to happen in my first few days across it, like the fuck that's going to stand up doing it again, right? Like, and that's the thing that drives us forward. It's always been almost a dismissive joke, but like your needs and needs of an Olympic athlete differ only by degree, not by kind. And we, everybody throws that thing around. But without the group model, that doesn't work, right? Because like the value of that Olympic athlete and that, and, that, and that person off the couch being in the same group, and we talk about this a lot in, in the scaling conversation in the course, which is that like the beauty of CrossFit is that everybody feels included. You know, at the end of the day, you know, it's a joke, but, you know, it's, we're all trauma bonded. We go through a near-death experience of a workout and we're like, Holy fuck, right? It's like we all went through a plane crash together. We'll never forget those people's faces. But if you don't do that and you don't work on that one-on-one, I'm not sure how it exists. I'm not saying, though, that the group model plus PT doesn't help because it can, for sure can. But absent of the group model, the PT model doesn't work. And I will be so bold as to say that. You know, you could almost say that the group model is can be um you know the gateway drug for you know leading people to pt who really want to be specific and and improve in specific areas or have that focused attention and accountability um but yeah most people are intimidated just being alone in a room with somebody one-on-one and there's just standing there watching them do stuff or or not do it very I'm well for they... fucking years i'm not working one-on-one with a coach to do cross it there's no fucking way i'm gonna stand there while chuck counts my burpees fuck yep. you it's not happening i don't care how much pain I'm in. Like, it's it's easy to lose sight of opportunities to step back not through just a ten thousand foot lens but like a hundred thousand foot lens and you know have you have you guys both been alive long enough to see that in nature there is like the micro, the macro, and the meta that is just always repeated endlessly. Like the structure of the atom is the structure of the solar system is the structure of the galaxy. And oh, by the way, they all also look like cells inside the body. And like, we just repeat shit endlessly at different levels. So is there a necessary relationship that needs to exist with the individual and the collective? Do people need to exist in societies, groups, and tribes? Awesome. Yes. Do people also need closer interpersonal relationships that operate in a deeper structure with a higher level of like self-sense and understanding with deeper communication and a smaller level? Awesome. Does everybody also need to have their relationship to self and the pieces that they do manage in the shadows on their own? Great. So if we agree that like nature replicates itself in scales that are both growing and shrinking, so like everybody probably to some degree needs a group and PT and some shit that they do on their own. Regardless of how we're looking at the context of those things, like that would be you learning academically. That would be you resolving shit with your shoulder. That would be you learning how to play the guitar. Like if we know that these things are repetitive in nature, then like we probably know that the group, 
the intricate individual and then like the self all need to exist because nature does nature shit. Every time. I'm just not going to fix my shoulder, right? Because it's my shoulder. Oh, it's just how my shoulder works. Yeah, it's just my wrist. Oh, I, got a, I got a bad wrist. Until you put me in a group model and I realize that everybody who's got the right kind of shoulders, which is the rest of the class, is fucking smashing me in a workout. Then you're, all of a sudden you're like, hey, uh, Chuck, you got some time after class so we can look at this shoulder? Right? Like, and that's the reason why like, the group model can be benefited by the individual model. But the reality is that without it, I'm not sure at what point I'm not just going to fight with Chuck and be like, dude. My shoulder's been this way my whole life. Can we just move on to something else like bicep curls? Mm. Right. And yeah. so like the coach might know objectively that there is an issue and they might objectively know how to fix it. But unless that individual changes a want into a need, like, man, there's a lot of conflict there because you're trying to sell them on something that you want as the provider and the practitioner that they're like, I don't get it. And we can help them get it. And we can have the deep, hard conversations. Be like, hey, this is your ability to pick your son up. This is your ability to take the trash out for your wife. But man, people are short-sighted, egotistical, nasty little monsters because like humans are humans. But you had mentioned earlier that men will die for points. And so like me correlating my fucked up shoulders like limitation to my marriage and my fathering might actually for a huge subset of humans matter a whole lot less than Jimmy smashing me in thrusters one stall mat over. Yep. The reward structure of the tribe is crazy fucking powerful. Yep. The, the amount of people I've had in, you know, um, my career is, oh, you know, I wouldn't have been able to get through that workout today or I would never have pushed myself that hard if I was in a class by myself or if I didn't have, you know, these other people who when you're running down the driveway and, and you're on that last mile of Murph and everything sucks and you're high-fiving people as you run down, you're like, okay, well, they're finishing, I'm going to finish. You know, it's, it's that power that we're all in this together um, that really – pushes people when they want to stop and then they see, you know, Mary, the 67-year-old grandma running past and they're like, oh, shit, I better start running now. Like, Mary's beating me on this run. i got to pick it up. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. the whole thing boils down to one central conflict and that's the conflict between teaching and coaching or training and coaching, whatever you want to call it. And, like, and, and the reality of the situation for most people is just that it's for sure much harder to teach in a group setting than it is one-on-one -on -one because – the central difference between training and coaching is convergent versus divergent, right? Trainers, teachers, et cetera, believe that there is one right answer, right? Because why else would they be teaching it? Why else would they be training it? Coaches believe that there is a divergent solution and that there's more than one solution to the problem. And if you are a coach, how could you not potentially consider, if nothing else, at least consider that maybe the group model might help solve for four, right? Help get that person to X. And that in and of itself should negate the entire debate. It's just harder to teach in a group format because you got 30 people and you got to communicate with all of them and they have to interpret what you're saying and receive what you're saying, believe what you're saying, and then try to do what you're saying. That's very hard to do. But as a coach, it's very easy to figure out what the limitation is to all 30 people in the room and then solve for that. Yep. Yeah. I'm just going to know your people. We just got to know also, that there's more than one answer. Like the whole thing becomes really interesting, it's, you know, and that's how you know that somebody has a bias in a specific version of the answer being like the convergent one that like individual is the right answer because it is where there is the greatest amount of time, energy, and attention on the individual from the coach. Cool. I wouldn't disagree with that. There is no one person plus one person is the greatest utilization of time and energy for sure. Nobody's debating that, but the group solves all kinds of problems that the individual cannot. Yep. So it's, it's supportive of the scale, right? Like if we want to make the world better group is a necessity. If we need to accommodate socioeconomic factors and the ability for us to price ourselves into or out of the ability to manage humans, it's a necessity. If humans learn through imitation, it isn't a necessity, but it is a, benefit if we understand reward structures and how we build habits and that habits and consistency are the thing that set people free with fitness for the rest of their life group is a necessity um and fuck like maybe at some point there is a recognition that like the group is worth existing for the sake of the group because how many humans do you know 
that are searching for a life that doesn't include more beneficial relationships that are supportive of their forward progress as humans. Dude, everybody needs a fucking tribe. Everybody needs a team. The world is a very dark, lonely, miserable fucking place if you don't have a tribe and a team. And some people need to look to an external source for that if they don't have, like, the traditional family <laughs> tribe or things like that. They're, 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 they're co-workers enough that they're like, yep, you yeah. know what? I don't need another access point to a group. Like, the people that I work with 40 hours a week, they're my fucking mates. Like, we, we see yeah. eye to eye. We're the same type of people interested in the same type of shit. Like, man, that's few and far between. So, like, the group is outside of people's employment or generally belonging to a spiritual group or some type of like practicing religious entity, like this is just maybe a good humaning piece to do because people need a group in their life one way or another. And so this is probably disproportionately a beneficial, healthy, accessible group option because I would agree with my own assumption that like people need a group period, no yeah. matter what. And so like if we can get them a group, that is also growth minded, that is also working on being healthier and fitter, that also like benefits exercise. Like if humans need a group, man, this is a pretty fucking good group to be able to like offer. Yeah. And it's, you know, the amount, uh, the, the data that I, I even I have from people who come to the door go, yeah, I want this to be just for me because I feel like in my outside life, I give to the family, I give to my coworkers, but this is something for me so they can come to our group and our tribe and be part rather than having to lead the tribe or be the person that is the person for the tribe. They can come and just be in the tribe and it gives, it fills their cup because it's giving them back to themselves. Right. I mean, as we're 40 minutes into this thing, so I don't know if we need to belabor it much more, but the reality is that CrossFit classes give people their life back, period. Right. And the human body is a perfect machine with an imperfect perception, a.k.a. the brain. There's just no way around moving somebody forward without addressing the elephant in the room, which is that we all have the perfect body. The system works perfectly. It's the brain that controls the body. And that in and of itself is the problem. And that's why on that sickness, fitness, wellness continuum or wellness, fitness continuum, the goal is to move people from sickness, death to life in the way that we do that through CrossFit. And what's unique in CrossFit, which is the truly unique part of CrossFit, is the neurological development of fitness, right? It's that whole other part of it. It's the second half. Like everybody in every global gym ever is organicing their way, at least to wellness. We know as CrossFitters, what truly separates us is those neurological aspects of fitness. And those things can only be developed through coaching, right? And what that really truly means is teaching less, understanding more, like why are double unders hard for you? Right? Why is coordination such a problem for you? Right. And like as the gymnastics guys who spent more than a decade teaching this to people around the world, it wasn't because we love gymnastics. It's because the entire nature of gymnastics is about perfection of movement with the understanding that it's a divergent solution. Right? You could never be a great gymnastics coach if you thought that there was only one way to get people to that perfect skill. You have no choice but to be divergent, understanding what's the problem with the athlete. But the reason why we stuck to it. And the reason why we gravitated towards it was that gymnastics gives people their life back, not because those bar muscle ups matter, but because getting people to understand and change their behavior, getting people to understand and adapt and address their neurological behavior is the way people get their life back. And unless they are a part of a group, they're not going to give a fuck because they won't even think it's remotely possible enough to even try to belabor themselves to do it. That's why the group model is superior. Awesome. And I think that's a good note to wrap up this week. I think we've we've covered that one. It was a really good chat um, with you gentlemen, as always, and thank you for your thoughts. And we will see you next time. Okay. Toodaloo. All right.